Our scripture this morning actually continues. This is the lectionary gospel reading for the Sunday. It, it continues from last Sunday, Luke 16, beginning at verse 19 and reading through verse 31. This is Jesus speaking. Hear the word of the Lord. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted Here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. May God bless the hearing and the living of this word. Amen. Again, like last Sunday, a teaching of Jesus focused on mammon, money, wealth. In fact, as I commented, today's passage follows almost as a commentary on the teaching of last Sunday, which is a lesson that Jesus summarized in a single sentence this way, you cannot serve both God and money. Hearing this, there are some religious leaders listening who sneer and scoff at Jesus' words. Luke says they are lovers of money. So first, let's notice that Jesus' story of the rich man and Lazarus is is addressed to a particular group of people, to those who want to love both God and money and who see no need to choose between them. Some people in this world are blessed with a natural immunity to the disease of loving money. They really don't care about it, one way or another. Have it, don't have it, doesn't matter. That's a rare breed. Across time and cultures, most humans are quite captivated and dazzled by the power of money. Money creates an attraction that easily becomes obsessive or at least a preoccupying focus of one's time and energy. 
getting money, protecting money, counting money, using money, all to advance oneself and one's family interests. We Americans live and breathe capitalism. We might as well call it moneyism, since capital is just another word for money. But capitalism is a modern invention, and love of money existed a long time before capitalism. So Jesus tells those around him, the ones who love money, he tells them this dramatic story of two people who live side by side but worlds apart. The story is dominated by great extremes, sharp boundaries, and dramatic reversals. It has two and only two scenes, and they are almost mirror opposites of each other. All these details drive home the point of the parable. The first scene is earthly. There's a rich man who lives in opulent luxury behind a massive gate. At that gate, but outside of it, lies a certain poor man whose name is Lazarus. The name Lazarus actually means one who has been helped, which is a rather ironic name since no one gives him any help at all. The rich man and Lazarus live in opposite worlds, but side by side, divided by a locked barrier, built and maintained by the rich man to keep out his poor neighbor, Lazarus, and others like him. The rich man is clothed in purple and fine linen, very costly clothing. Lazarus is clothed in nasty boils and sores, uncovered and open. The rich man eats fine food every day. Lazarus is chronically hungry, too weak to work or even to beg. He simply lies outside the rich man's gate hoping for nothing more than whatever crumbs might fall off the rich man's table. But the rich man does not even offer Lazarus the scraps from his plate. In fact, the rich man ignores Lazarus completely, as if he does not exist at all, stepping past him each time he passes through his gate. Only the mongrels on the street have compassion on Lazarus. Jesus says, at least the dogs come and lick his wounds to comfort him. One day, Lazarus dies. But, typical of the poor, he receives no burial. Angels carry him to the bosom of Abraham who is the friend of God and the first great patriarch of Israel. To be gathered after death to the bosom of Abraham was an ancient expression for consolation and refreshment in paradise. Then the rich man dies, as all people, rich and poor, do. But unlike Lazarus, the rich man's body is honored with a fine burial. And now we move into scene two, life after death. A little background first. Parables always speak in the language of the audience. In the Old Testament, the place of the dead was called in Hebrew, Sheol. In Greek, it's called Hades. It was thought, Sheol, Hades, to be underneath the earth, a subterranean place of darkness and inactivity. All of the dead, good and bad, together 
end up in Sheol. And there they exist as weak shadows of their earthly selves. In Israel, over time, the belief takes hold that the righteous and the unrighteous dead in Sheol exist in separate parts of Sheol. That one is a place of fire and torment for the evil ones, and the other is a place of refreshment and comfort for the righteous. This is the scene presented in Jesus' parable. Both the rich man and Lazarus are in Sheol, in Hades, but their fortunes have reversed. Lazarus is in the place of comfort with Father Abraham, and the rich man is in the place of fire and torment. I said last Sunday that parables usually have a surprise ending. This is it. People of the ancient world believed what many people today still believe, that having wealth and money is a sign of God's favor, of God's blessing, which then implies the opposite, that poverty and affliction and disease are signs of God's disfavor, God's punishment for something done or undone in someone's life. If riches and wealth are a sign of God's favor, then surely the wealthy are destined for paradise. Even Jesus' disciples believe this. They say so in, in Luke 18. But surprise, surprise, the poor man, Lazarus, is in paradise. And the rich man is in the place of fire and torment. Jesus' audience would have found this scene to be stunning, to be totally unexpected. The rich man looks up from his torment and sees way off in the distance Abraham, and there beside him, Lazarus. And now it's the rich man who needs mercy. Father Abraham, he calls out, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in the cool water and cool my tongue because the fire here is agonizing. Father Abraham hears and answers him, but he gives him two reasons why his request is impossible to fulfill. The first reason is that how one lives on earth determines how one lives after earth. Remember all those good things you received in your lifetime, Abraham asks him, and all the bad things heaped on Lazarus. So now he receives comfort and you receive the torment. Besides that, Abraham continues, no one can go from here to there or from there to here, even if they wanted to. There is a great uncrossable chasm that is fixed between us here and you there. Hearing this, the rich man thinks of his brothers still living on earth. Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house to warn my five brothers so they don't come to this place of torment. Again, Abraham listens patiently, but he cannot be moved to intervene. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. This is a direct reference to the Torah and to the prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament. Abraham means to say, no more information is needed because the Word of God already tells them to give alms to the poor, to be merciful to the afflicted, to the poor, to the alien, to the vulnerable of society. They have been told. They have been warned. 
Again, the rich man pleads for some preferential treatment for his brothers. Don't expect them to heed the scriptures. Send someone like Lazarus back from the dead. Then they'll listen. Abraham answers, no, they won't. Why does Abraham say this? Because the five brothers are not ignorant of the commands. They are simply hard-hearted against the poor. Said another way, they are slaves to their wealth. They have chosen to serve their idol, money, and cannot also serve the one true God. Repeatedly, the God of Abraham, of Moses, of the prophets, warns God's people to care for the poor, the sick, the weak, the vulnerable, the resident alien in their midst. Jesus teaches the same. The problem is not a lack of information, but a lack of loyalty. Not ignorance, but resistance. Not ill will, but inaction. Does this parable speak to us? How do you hear it? Are there uncaring, self-consumed, rich people in our world? Are there poor and needy people waiting for help outside the gates, outside the walls, outside the borders? Is there a great chasm between the rich and the poor in our world, in our nation, in our commonwealth? That's an interesting word, commonwealth. North Carolina is a state. Pennsylvania is a commonwealth. How about in our county? Which side of the chasm are we on, do you think? Does how you and I live here today, how we give mercy or do not give mercy, does that have any bearing on the life to come? Does it have any effect, any influence? Is this parable comforting or worrisome to you? And what if it is? Does it apply just to individuals, or might it also apply to groups of people, to churches, to towns, to states, to nations? What is our responsibility to those who suffer. To God, does it matter Lazarus's citizenship status, his race, his language group, his nation of origin? When are we excused from being merciful? When are we excused from being merciful? Would you bow with me in prayer? Oh God, the stories of Jesus are at least 2,000 years old. We weren't even in anybody's mind when these words were spoken. And certainly the world as it is wasn't either. But here we are. Help us, O Lord, as people of faith, people of conviction, people of compassion, and people 
of this world we live in, to be merciful to those around us, for eyes to be open and our hearts to be open, to see those that you have placed as our neighbors, and may we be kind. May we be kind. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.